Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video we have my Double Game Week 34 preview with of course a specific focus on the players that double in Game Week 34 and which ones I think you should bring into your team and also select on your free hit. If you do enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button and if you're new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, this is going to be an incredibly weird way to start the video because this video is going to be very stats heavy as it always is the game week preview. We do some deep analysis and I'm going to use underlying data, but I interestingly feel like for game week 34 in particular, statistics are far less important and useful than they usually are. And let me explain why that's the case. I think statistics are very, very good predictors, especially underlying statistics like expected goal involvement and some of the other stuff we'll look at today. I find them arguably to be the best predictor of future performance in FPL over a long period of time. So let's say I'm wildcarding in game week 30 and I'm trying to bring in players that I think will score well for the next four to six game weeks, along with fixtures, I think underlying data is the best predictor of players that I expect to continue performing at a high level and therefore getting FPL returns. But in game week 34, many people are either free hitting in 34 or they're wild carding in 35. And therefore, for a lot of people, we're looking at one week punts. I even feel like even if you're not free hitting 34 or wild card 35, you may still be looking at slightly shorter punts. I mean, even if you're only looking for the remainder of the season, there aren't that many game weeks left now. So I actually think, especially for those that are only looking at game week 34, stats can still be very useful. And I would still at least look at them but you could genuinely just go off gut feeling and vibe because think about it. In a single game week, you never predict the high scoring players, right? If you look at the dream team every week, the players that score the most points in FPL, it is always the most random teams. So I would just say don't em overemphasize the importance of stats. And that's going to sound weird because all I'm going to talk about here is stats, but I'm a content creator. I can't sit here and say I'd pick McBurney because I've got a good feeling. That would be like, well, you've got nothing to back that. So I have to present stats. That's the only way, real way for me to do this. But for you guys, if you've just got a good feeling that Darwin's going to outscore Diaz, you don't know why, but you think he's good or that Jota will outscore Diaz, just go for it, right? Because anything can happen in a single game week. So with that caveat in place, let's now take a look at some underlying data. So this first section is the team data. And a bit later, we're going to look at individual data. I think individual data is more useful, but I do think it's worth looking at how are these teams actually performing? Do they have better defenses? Do they have better attacks? Or are they terrible for both? And what about the opposition that they're facing? So in this table, I have these seven teams that double. Of course, you could look at single game week players, by the way. But for me, I'm going to focus on the teams that double. The first two columns are their attacking data across the season and across the last six. So non-penalty expected goals per 90. The next two columns are their defensive data across the season and across the last six. And then the final two columns is their opposition, the, the team that they're playing against attacking data over the last six. So how well is the team that they're playing against attacking? And then the final column is opposition defensive rank. So how well is the team that they're playing against currently defending? This should give us a bit of an idea about should we generally be looking more at their defense or the attack from the seven teams that double? So let's start with the attacking data of all of the teams. Clearly, the standout option if you're looking at team attacking data is Liverpool. So Liverpool ranked first over the season and over the last six for non-penalty expected goals. So you don't need me to probably tell you this, but Liverpool are the best attack in the league. And if you are predicting teams that are going to score a hell of a lot of goals, Liverpool are usually top of that. Interestingly, Arsenal aren't bad, right? They're fourth across the season, but they're actually eighth across the last six. So I'm not saying Arsenal are a bad attack, but I'm not putting Arsenal in that upper echelon, one of the best teams in the league. Across the season, they are fourth, but they've dropped off a little bit recently. They didn't score against Bayern, although I'm not really buying into that too much because it's Bayern Munich, right? But Bayern, Bayern, that wasn't a deliberate pun. However, I don't think they're co like a completely free scoring attack. So this would suggest team data wise, double Liverpool attack is probably better than double Arsenal attack, for example. After that, you're probably looking at a combination of Bournemouth and Everton as being the next two best attacks, but they're kind of middling. And across the last six, Everton have been really, really bad. But across the season, they're ninth and 10th. So Bournemouth and Everton aren't bad attacks. But you can see here that team data wise, we're not really got many good attacks to go off. After that, you've got Wolves in 16th, Palace in 18th, and then Sheffield United, the worst attack in the league across the season. So it is slim pickings in terms of which of these teams attack well, but definitely if you can get probably two Liverpool attackers, this would suggest as a minimum, at least one, maybe two Arsenal attackers. And after that, you are probably looking at Bournemouth, Everton, and maybe a couple sprinkled in elsewhere. 
I will just note that Palace's data is obviously mainly under Hodgson. And since Glasner's has come in, they're actually a lot, lot better. So over the last six, they're now up to 10th. And I think in the last couple, we've seen some very good attacking performances from them. So I think Palace, unfortunately, because we don't have much data under the new management, I don't think they're the best to look at across the season. But I do think that there has been a recent Im improvement in Palace's attacking data. When we're looking at defences, we do have a team that is again ranked first and first across the season in the last six, and that's Arsenal. So this does paint a very clear picture of why so many people are saying double Arsenal defence and double Liverpool attack, because that's what the data suggests. But... Liverpool's defence is very good. People are saying Liverpool are bad because they concede. And yes, you do want the clean sheets, of course. But across the season, they're the third best defence. And across the last six, they're the second best defence. So Liverpool are a very, very good defence. And therefore, when I look at this, Arsenal and Liverpool are both very good attacks and very good defences. And while, while statistically, double Arsenal defence and double Liverpool attack, from a team perspective, might make more sense. Again, in a single game week, anything can happen. It could be that Arsenal concede in both games could be that Liverpool to keep two clean sheets. So I would look at this and say, as long as you've got six players from Arsenal and Liverpool, you're probably fine. And I think you could justify loading up on attackers or defenders from these two teams. After that, across the season, again, is Bournemouth and Everton are the next strongest teams on the line data-wise. And actually, over the last six, Bournemouth have been slightly better defensively. They're the fifth best defence. So Bournemouth may be being underrated slightly. And we'll discuss in a second. The fixtures are also very good. People are saying that these aren't good fixtures from a defensive perspective. But I look at this and I think, do you know what? Maybe they are. But on the other hand, Everton recently have been absolutely appalling. I mean, they just conceded six goals, by the way, to Chelsea. They're currently ranked 16th over the last six for defensive data. So I think even more so than the attack, right? I said there's slim pickings in the attack from the teams we're targeting. The defence, it feels even worse. And this is why so many people like just pick Gabrielle White and then like Van Dyke and just fill your defence with Arsenal and Liverpool because the other teams, you're just not really backing clean sheets here. And I kind of would suggest you're probably in a similar situation here. So it is really, it's slim pickings in the attack, but it's even more slim pickings in the defence. Just quickly on the fixture matchups, which we're going to look at in a little bit more detail in the next section. There are a few matchups that stick out. Sheffield United have the best fixtures. They're playing against Burnley and Manchester United, who are not only two of the worst defences, but also two of the worst attacks as well. You can see here that Manchester United and Burnley are not attacking or defending well at all. So I look at this and I think, do you know what? These, while Sheffield United are the easy fixture technically, these two can't be ignored. And it's why so many people are considering the likes of Brereton Diaz, who we'll discuss later. And maybe even like a Bogle or a McBurney could be an okay option. I think the other team that surprisingly stood out here for me is Bournemouth. Because people are saying they've got really tricky fixtures. And both of them are away. I'm aware of that. But defensively and attacking wise, over the last six, Villa and Wolves have been pretty poor. So I look at Bournemouth's fixtures and I say, maybe they're being underrated slightly. Maybe you could play a Bournemouth defender like Senesi or Zabani. Maybe Solanke is more essential than we're giving him credit for because these are not actually, again, according to the data over the last six, they're not terrible fixtures for Bournemouth. Wolves probably have the most tricky fixtures, right? And when you look at this data... They're 16th across the season and across the last six for attacking data and 10th across the season and the last six for defensive data. And they've got probably the most difficult double, maybe along with Everton, but probably Wolves would be the standout. It does make sense that a lot of people aren't necessarily looking to load up on Wolves players on their free hit, for example. So I'm going to leave it there because there's a lot more to cover in today's video and I don't want it to be too long. But there's some interesting team data regarding underlying statistics. Let's now take a look at some market odds team data because I think that can also be useful to partner with this to give us the most complete picture possible. So guys, we've got this wonderful diagram or table graph courtesy of Rob T FPL over on Twitter. I want to give full credit to him. I've literally just stolen his image, but I'm sure he doesn't mind because I'm giving him the credit. So go follow Rob T FPL over on Twitter. He honestly, or X, I probably should say, he creates some genuinely fantastic graphics. I mean, they're aesthetically pleasing, but they're also very useful. And I would say pretty much every week I look at Rob's graphics. And what we've essentially got here is data from SpreadX. So it's to do with market odds. And the reason that's useful is it's not just underlying data that's considered in market odds. It's also injuries. It's what they've got to play for. It's motivation. Market odds take into account lots of various things that underlying data won't. And what this wonderful graph that Rob's put together does is it gives us the total projected goals for each team and the percentage chance of at least one clean sheet. 
So you would expect the teams that have doubles to have more projected goals because they have two fixtures. And you would expect the teams that have double to probably, unless they're really bad fixtures, have a higher predicted percentage for a clean sheet. So there are a few things I want to point out. I'm not going to again go into this in too much detail, but you can pause it and look at it yourself or go and check out Rob's Twitter. There are two teams that are projected to get a hell of a lot of goals and significantly more goals than everyone else. And that is Liverpool and Arsenal, both projected to get 4.65 and 4.6 goals respectively each. The next closest is Crystal Palace at 2.98. So this goes back to the idea, I know I said in the previous section, double Arsenal defence or two Liverpool defenders could make sense because the other teams aren't likely to keep clean sheets. But these two teams are also significantly more likely than others to score four or five goals across this double. So maybe double Liverpool attack and double Arsenal attack with one defender from each team might be the optimal play here. But as you can see, the other issue is they've also got the significantly higher chance of a clean sheet, right? Arsenal at 63% and Liverpool at 55 So realistically, you probably want three attackers and three defenders from each of these teams, but you don't have enough spots. So it really comes down to your own prediction of how you see these games going. I think both teams have a good chance of scoring a few goals and maybe keeping one clean sheet in the double. That would be my prediction. And therefore, it probably doesn't matter too much which way you go with it, but just trust your gut feeling on this occasion. The team with the third highest projected goals and also the third highest chance for a clean sheet is Crystal Palace. So I would say, and this goes along with what a lot of people are doing, triple up on Liverpool, triple up on Arsenal. And then if you can, if you're on a free hit or you've got free transfers, Crystal Palace are the next best team to attack. I think they're in a nice run of form. I really like the fixtures, especially from an attacking perspective, but they're also a very, very solid defence. So I love the idea of, if possible, getting at least two or three Crystal Palace assets in. And then after that is Bournemouth. Interestingly, the only team that sneaks in there in the middle of all of these doubling teams is actually Manchester United. And the reason I want to discuss them is if you've got no remaining chips, if you're watching this, you're like, I've got nothing left, and you've already got five, six, seven doublers, and you're happy with your team, using your transfers on Man United players isn't the worst idea, given that not only do they play Sheffield United at home this week, which is a good fixture on paper, but they've also then got Burnley at home in game week 35. After that, I think they've got Palace. Then they double, and I think it's Brentford as the final game. So Man United will serve you really well for the rest of the season, along with Newcastle. But this is actually a pretty good entry point for the likes of Bruno Fernandes, Rasmus Hoyland, Dallow, Onana. So don't feel like you can't go out there and buy a United asset. But for me, I still would be targeting the doublers. So hopefully that does help. So now that we've looked at the team data, now that we've looked at the overall goals and clean sheet odds as well, let's now take a look at position by position, starting with the defenders, the players that I'd be targeting for double game week 34. So guys, you'll have to forgive me. The graphics aren't as good as they normally are because I've literally just screenshotted this from my Excel spreadsheet that I've been working off and obviously made it a little bit neater as well. I've tried to keep it fairly simple. So we're going to start with the defenders. I should just say goalkeepers, I'm not going to discuss here because just back a keeper that you think will make saves and keep clean sheets. It's fairly obvious with that. And we've already spoken about, we spoke about goalkeepers for 18 minutes in last week's video. So I don't want to go over goalkeepers again. I'm going to start with defenders. And because we've already discussed team data, and we've already discussed the fixtures in a bit of detail, I'm really just going to focus on attacking threat here. So do partner what I'm about to say with clean sheet odds as well for each of these defenders. But what I've got is I've got their ranking according to non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 across the season. So the defenders are ranked according to season-long goal threat and assist threat, essentially. After that, I've then got their non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 over the last six. I've then got their shots in the box per 90 over the season. So just see, are they also getting quite a few shots in the box? And then the final column is, are they a decent permanent transfer? I.e., if you're not free hitting 34 and you're not wild carding 35, are they okay as a player to bring in and hold? The, the players that have like gold on their ranking, it basically means that they are my favorite options to bring in this week. So you can see that according to that, I think Trent Robbo, Gabriel Tarkovsky, White and Munoz would be my top options to bring in this week. So with all of that being said, you can see that if we were to just go off attacking threat, the best five defenders to own for 34 would be Trent, Robbo, Eight, Nuri, Gabriel and Tarkovsky. By the way, genuinely could make an argument that that is the best five defenders that you could pick on a free hit. Trent and Robbo have such ridiculous upside that not only do you have the clean sheet potential with them, you also have the attacking threat as well. So they're almost like having extra attackers with the odd chance that you might get a clean sheet in there. So you can't really argue against Trent and Robbo from an attacking perspective. Eight Nuri, whether he plays left wing or left wing back, is so attacking. You can see here, data has been ridiculous across the last six and across the season. Gabriel, we know about his attacking threat. And Tarkovsky has actually had really good solid data across the season and the last six. 
So honestly, if you just went for those five, you'd be fine in terms of attacking for it. I suppose the issue that we've got is a few of these are minutes doubts, right? Alexander-Arnold, my prediction right now, I've actually gone off Trent. I think Trent, and I'm recording this on Wednesday night, by the way, my prediction is Trent starts against Atalanta, is benched in the first game of 34, and starts in the second. So I think you only get one start from Trent, which calls into question, let's say he gets 80 minutes and then 30 minutes. Is 110 minutes of Trent better than 180 minutes of Van Dijk? I'm less sure about that because you don't get the clean sheet in the game that he comes off the bench, right? So I love Trent and he could do damage in that one game and he could start to, by the way, that's just my prediction, but I've gone off him slightly. And the other, obviously, minutes risk here is eight Nuri. And I think eight Nuri there again is a good chance that he only plays one game in the double two. And if he does play two, is there a chance that he comes off early in one of them, maybe even before 60 minutes? He's also not going to be playing this left wing role. So whilst his data across the season, even at left back, was pretty good, it has been much better recently because he's been playing left wing. But Huang is now back, so I don't think eight Nuri gets the same level of minutes. Robertson and Gabriel, however, are probably my two favorite defender picks. I don't need to speak about Gabriel in too much detail. The only risk would be if you think there's a chance he's benched in one of the two. I'm going to say that I think he'll start both, especially with Arsenal now out of the Champions League. But I think Gabriel is probably a slightly more of a minutes risk than the likes of Saliba. Robertson, I actually think will start both. But let's see what his minutes, like, minutes are like against Atalanta. If he gets like 90 against Atalanta, I might go off him slightly. But if he gets... 30 to 60, especially if Simakas starts, I'd feel pretty good about a start for Robbo in both games in 34. So I would say at the moment, my two favorite options are probably Robertson and Gabriel. I like Trent, but only if you're willing to take the risk. If not Trent, Van Dijk still got okay attacking data across the season. Across the last 60, he hasn't, he hasn't had many chances, but I do back Van Dijk to just get a bullet header from time to time. So I certainly don't mind him. And obviously Ben White, very decent attacking option if you want to go against Gabriel. I just think that his minutes are the least secure out of Gabriel, Saliba, and Ben White. Other options that could be in there. Senesi's got pretty good attacking data. I said that I actually don't mind the fixtures for Senesi, so you could go for a cheeky punt on him if you wanted to, but maybe you don't want to back two away fixtures for Bournemouth. But I've actually got Senesi in my free here. He's just currently tucked on the bench. Anyone else deserve a shout out? Mikalenko got decent attacking data, but this would suggest that actually Tarkovsky is probably the better one to go for. Bogle, if you want to go super different, we know about how good Bogle's fixtures are. I don't think Sheffield United will keep a clean sheet, but he's got attacking threat. And could they keep a clean sheet against Burnley maybe? Potentially, but I don't think so. So I probably wouldn't go there. There are some other options. Branthwaite, if he's available, but he did come off with an injury. Dawson, Kilman, Saliba, Mitchell, Semedo. These are the 18 options that I would consider. But going off the data, I think it's one of Trent and Robertson, if not both. And I would probably back Robertson at the moment based on recent performances and fitness levels. Ain't Nuri, if he is fully, fully fit, deserves consideration. Gabriel and or White, I think are good picks. And I still don't mind either Tarkovsky, Munoz, Van Dijk, Mikalenko, Bogle, one of those to make up the rest of your defense. So let me know down below if you're on a free hit in particular, but also if you're not. Which of these five defenders will you have going into game week 34? So moving on to the midfielders, I actually think the midfield is the hardest part of the free hit for me. Not all five of them. I've actually had three midfielders in every single draft, but two of them are very difficult in particular. And even if you're not on free hit, you might have two or three doublers anyway. And you're just looking, you've got one midfield transfer to use. Who on earth do you bring in? So let's discuss the midfielders. It's the same as per the defenders. So non-penalty expected goal involvement over the season, over the last six, shots in the box per 90, and whether they are an okay permanent transfer. And when I'm looking at are they an okay permanent transfer, I'm looking at are they a very good FPL option that you're just happy playing in most weeks anyway? Or do I think they have the fixtures to serve them longer term? But most of the players that Dublin 34, you probably don't want beyond, which is why I don't mind the idea of bringing in a Man United or Newcastle asset, by the way, if you aren't free, if sorry, if you have no remaining chips and you need them from 35 onwards. So with all of that in mind, the three players that I've had on every single free hit draft are Salah. Don't need me to explain why. Let's see how many minutes he gets against Atalanta. But he's probably the most secure Liverpool attacker for minutes, maybe outside of McAllister. He's got the best data on this list. He's just a brilliant option, right? He's on penalties. I know he's not been performing perfectly recently, but I see absolutely no reason to go against him unless you are really, really chasing a mini league or something like that. So Salah in every draft. Saka has been in every draft. But I don't know that he's going to start both of these. I would predict now that Arsenal are out of the Champions League that Saka will start both because what are they saving Saka for, right? Let's at least, the, the Arsenal perspective will be, let's at least go for the title and give it everything. So I think Saka now starts both definitely in 34 if he's fit to. 
And again, his data is good. Across the last six, there's been a bit of a drop-off, but it's still good enough. He's still first-choice penalty taker, still on set pieces. So Salah and Saka are in every single team and draft. And if you don't own either of them, I still feel like they are fine to bring in. And then the third one is actually Eberechi Eze, who's actually fifth on this list for non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 across the season. He's actually, I think, fourth on this list across the last six as well. There's actually been a slight uptick since the new managers come in. So I think Eze is just got the fixtures we think he's got the penalties although we don't know that he's got the minutes he's got the fitness Crystal Palace are playing really nice football I would say Eze is the third best midfield option by some distance for me ahead of game week 34 the only thing that would change my mind on this is if I don't know we somehow someone came out and said Elise is definitely on penalties like Eze or Elise came out and said this Elise is on penalties which isn't going to happen if I had confirmation Elise was on penalties and that Eze wasn't then sure, I don't think Eze is as good of an option. But the potential of penalties on top of his non-penalty data still being pretty good, for me, makes Eze the third best option for 34. After that, the waters are muddied a bit because I think there are loads of really good options. According to the data across the season, if you were to select five midfielders for game at 34, it would be Salah, Saka, Diaz, Elise, Eze. Again, as I said with the top five defenders for attacking data... I honestly think that is arguably the best midfield five. So you could, by the way, if you're on a free hit, you could just, you know, just say, do you know what? I'm just going to back the attacking data across the season, pick the five most attacking defenders, the five most attacking midfielders, and then the three forwards with the best data and just see how I get on because these five are great. The only concern that I would have over Elise is Arky's minutes secure, but I suppose that's the same for Diaz. It's the same for Jota. It's arguably the same for Havertz. Huang He Chan too. Most of the players on these lists, you, you could argue that you can't confirm if they're going to start both. Again, it's the same for Trent and Robbo in defense too. But Elise in particular has just come back to, to full, full fitness. He's not at full fitness yet. So I would not be surprised to see Elise either get early subs in both like 60 and 70 minutes, which would be fine by the way, or potentially get 70 and then 30. I'm not fully convinced yet by Elise's minutes. By the way, his data across the last six, he's barely played any minutes. So ignore his data across the last six. Across the season, it's good. And I do expect him to be a good option for 34. I just wonder, without his minutes being fully secure, and without knowing if he is indeed on penalties ahead of Eze, are there potentially slightly better picks? I think one of Diaz or Jota could genuinely be the one. But who's going to start both? Let's. I'm recording this again on Wednesday. It's actually Thursday at midnight now. So happy Thursday. Let's see how many minutes they get against Atalanta. Because if Jota starts and gets 80 and Diaz gets 10 off the bench, you, you're looking at, you know, you've got definitely got probably that first start in 34 for Diaz. And it could be that Diaz starts both and it's actually Darwin and Jota get a game apiece, which some people seem to believe. I would definitely say that at the moment, at the time of your recording, Diaz's minutes are probably slightly higher than Jota's, based on my own estimation. But Jota is just such a good FPO option. You can see his data is really good. He gets a lot of shots in the box per 90. It's very difficult to overlook Jota when he's fully fit. So I think if Jota doesn't start against Atalanta and gets like 20 or 30 minutes, you could definitely take a punt on him. Or you just go with the slightly safer minutes of Luis Diaz. Or you could just avoid altogether. You could say, Do you know what? I want to have Salah. I want to have Saka. I want to have Eze. And actually, I might just go for one more midfielder and then go for a 3-4-3. Three, three. And someone that I think deserves consideration is Brereton Diaz. Now, lots of people are saying, I don't get this pick. Sheffield United stink. Surely it is better to just go for like Havertz, Jota, Diaz from teams that actually score goals. And I fully understand that, that point of view. And if that is your point of view and you, you want to stick to that, then that's absolutely fine. My argument would be, despite the fact that we've just looked at team data, team data is entirely irrelevant if the player that you're bringing in still does the goals, right? So Brereton Diaz, does Diaz's data in a bad Sheffield United team is still as good as Jota, Eze, Elise, Sarabia, Havertz. In fact, it's slightly better than some of those players over the last six. So yes, he's not playing in a good team. And no, he's probably not got the quality of some of these other players. But he is putting up good data and getting good chances on a consistent basis now. He's not played as many minutes as some of these other players, but he's played enough for me to say, hang on a second, we have got a midfielder in FPL playing as an out-and-out -out striker alongside McBurney. He's getting chances, and he plays against two of the worst defences in the league. And his minutes appear to be very secure. Now, I can't confirm that it will start both, but he seems to be getting pretty much 90 in both. Most people seem to think that it's McBurney that will drop out if Archer comes in. So I think with Brereton Diaz, you've got great fixtures, good underlying data, good minutes. And I will just chuck in there, 
Brereton Diaz has actually got a very good penalty record. And I know McBurney has taken penalties this season, but they've actually not had a penalty when Brereton Diaz has been on the pitch. And will McBurney be on the pitch for the second game? I think there is a small chance that Brereton Diaz takes a penalty ahead of McBurney. But even if you don't believe that to be the case, if we don't expect McBurney to get 90 and 90, and we do expect that for Brereton Diaz... If McBurney's not on the pitch, then Brereton Diaz could take it. Although I do understand once again that Sheffield United have other penalty takers that could still be ahead of Brereton Diaz in the pecking order. But even without the penalties, I just feel like he's got a lot of what you'd want. And he's a fun pun, whether you're on free hit or not. But I wouldn't look to bring him in if you're not either on free hit or wildcard 35, because he's not a long-term player that I'd, I'd particularly want to hold on to. So I really like him, and he's been in most of my free hit drafts. Sarabia, I would pick Sarabia if I knew for a fact he was on penalties. But as per... Elise and Eze, I don't know who's on pens for Wolves. It could be Sarabia, it could be Cunha, it could be Huang. Therefore, again, unless I get confirmation Sarabia's on pens, his open play date is just not quite there alongside some of the other options. And again, I don't really like the fixtures for Wolves. So Sarabia is not a consideration. If you own Huang, probably keep him. But if you don't own Huang, I wouldn't look to bring him in now with these, obviously the fact that he's just coming back from injury. The only other two players that I want to discuss is Havertz and Erdegaard. Havertz's data is definitely better than Erdegaard's, right? Erdegaard's is very consistent, but it's not fantastic. And there's bit of an, been a bit of an upturn in Havertz's data since he's been playing as the number nine, which I expect to be the case more often than not. My only concern would be Havertz has played a lot of minutes recently. So has Erdegaard, but Erdegaard just does that consistently for Arsenal anyway. Is there a small chance that Havertz gets a rest in one of these games? I think given that Arsenal are now out of the Champions League, I think it's less likely. So I would feel... Not very confident, but relatively confident that Havertz now starts both games. And I think he'll start at least one of them as the number nine. And therefore, I think if Havertz does start both, if that is your prediction and my prediction, I just think Havertz is a better option than Erdegaard. The only reason I would go for Erdegaard is for two things. One, if you think Saka's projected minutes are quite low, because when Saka's not on the pitch, Erdegaard is on penalty. So that's the first thing. If Saka's mins are very low for you, Erdegaard becomes a better option due to the penalties. But also, if you expect Havertz to not start both, then of course go for Erdegaard. But Erdegaard has been carrying a bit of a knock. There's no telling that Erdegaard isn't the one that would get benched in one of these two. So I just think that out of Havertz and Erdegaard, if you've got a fresh choice now, I don't see any reason that you wouldn't go for Havertz unless you expect these minutes to be much lower. There are some other options you could go for. Everton, Bournemouth, Hamy you could go for. McAllister, if you want a slightly more nailed Liverpool attacker. But for me, it's Salah, Saka, Eze. And then you fill out those final two spots with Elise, Diaz, Jota, Brereton, Diaz, Havertz, Erdegaard, or one of those kinds of players. Let me know again ahead of 34, which five midfielders will you have? So guys, finishing off with the forwards, there are far less forwards to pick from. I've only got 10 and actually we have the only single game week player of this entire video discussed here, which is Erling Haaland, because we do need to discuss, is Haaland better than some of these doublers for this week? So I've only got 10 listed here. On Haaland, he did come off after full time against Real Madrid before extra time, and he was limping when he came off. But then in the post-match, I was going to say post-match celebration, City weren't celebrating. But when he came onto the pitch at the end, it didn't look like he was overly limping at that point. And actually, Man City's game against Brighton isn't for another week. So I think there is a good chance that we actually see Haaland fine for them. But let's wait and see what the update we get is from Pep. If he looks like he'll be fine, a lot of people are going to ask the question, is it worth doing Haaland to a double game week forward in 34 if we're maybe wildcarding in 35? I will just say if you're not wildcarding 35... No, because you want to bring him straight back in. But if you are, I think if it's for free and you've got absolutely nowhere else where you think that transfer upgrades your team, then yes, I would do it. But only in those two cases, if it's free and if there is not another place where you're like, do you know what? I could bring in a much better doubler in this spot. Let's say, I don't know, you've got, I'm not going to say Zabani is a bad option, but let's say you've got Zabani. You think I've got the money to go from Zabani to Van Dyke. That might be a better move than Haaland to another double forward. So unless the rest of your team's looking really good and it's for free, I probably wouldn't do it. For a hit, I just wouldn't go anywhere near it. I would just trust Haaland unless he is a serious doubt going into that game. Going into the deadline, we think there's a good chance he doesn't play. So after Haaland, who has the best data on this list by far, the only player that gets close to him, and he gets very close, by the way, is Darwin. Darwin's data has always been exceptionally good. But he has been like peak levels of Darwin Nunez recently. Like he is not finishing anything. By the way, Haaland isn't finishing anything either. But Darwin is going back to what we saw from him from last season. There have been spells this season where he started to finish slightly better. And it's been like, hang on a second. Are we starting to see a different Darwin? 
And it's just not been that case recently. And I think not only are Liverpool fans frustrated, I think we're starting to see Klopp being very frustrated as well because his team are creating chances. And I know it's not only Darwin missing them, but Darwin is the main culprit a lot of the time, along with Salah. And so I think there is a very, very good chance Darwin only starts one of the two games in 34. However, if again, Jota gets like 90 mins against Atalanta and Darwin doesn't get anything, well, then that would tell me Darwin at least gets the first start. And if he has a good performance there, maybe Jota even re-aggravates his injury or something crops up, then Darwin could start both. But I feel like even without Jota in the picture, Gakpo's performances recently have been pretty good. You can see his data here has actually been very close to Darwin and Haaland in the last six. Across the season, Gakpo's days have been okay as well. And I just think there's a chance that both Jota and Gakpo get one game in 34, which is why the likes of Diaz and Darwin, I think, are major risks. The question, though, is Darwin's probably going to get, let's say, 80 minutes and 20 minutes. Is 100 to 110 minutes of Darwin better than 180 of, I don't know, someone like a, let's say, Mateta or Cunha? Would you rather, I don't think either will get 180, but would you rather Mateta for 180 or Darwin for 110? The data probably suggests it's not that far off. And Darwin is very good off the bench. So just because a lot of people are saying and predicting, like myself, that Darwin doesn't start both, it doesn't mean that he's a terrible option for the double. And definitely if you own Darwin, you don't sell him. But I just wonder, is he the best transfer in this week? And is he the best player to pick on free hit? I'm less sure. Gabriel Jesus and Gakpo both have pretty good data, but they probably don't. I wouldn't expect either of them to start both, so I don't think they're serious options. And I think DCL and Beto, I don't expect either of them to start both, unless DCL is, is out. But I still don't think I'd go out there and pick Beto on a free hit or, or as, as a transfer. So I don't think the Everton attackers for me are serious considerations. On Solanke, Solanke is very, very good, right? His data across the season is strong. He's nailed for 90 minutes when he's fit. He's on penalties. Bournemouth across the season have attacked fairly well. My only concern with Solanke is out of all of the players on this list, over the last six, he's got the worst data. So Solanke is not in a nice run of form in terms of the chances he's getting. He's still getting points though, and he's still getting goals. And I think that's what Solanke does. He doesn't need the best data because I think he's a good finisher and he's on pens and he plays for 90 minutes. So he will get chances. And as I said in the first section, I actually quite like the fixtures. A lot of people are saying they don't. I quite like the fixtures for Solanke from an attacking perspective. So I don't think you need Solanke. I wouldn't say... Like, there are certain players on this free here. I think you need probably an Arsenal defender. I'd have a Liverpool defender. I'd have Salah, Saka, Eze. I don't put Solanke in that essential status. I don't think Solanke is a must-have on a free hit. And I don't think he's a must-have with your transfers either. But if you've got him, you keep him. And if you do look at the rest of the forwards, as I am at the moment, just thinking it's quite a, a dire situation, really, to pick him from the forwards then Solanke is fine to pick as well. And in most of my drafts, I've got Solanke. But do bear in mind that his data over the last six has been quite disappointing. You've then got a few other players. So McBurney, if McBurney was nailed on, and I mean, he was getting 90 minutes every week, I swear to you, I would have McBurney. The reason for that is I think he's on pens. His underlying data is very, very good. And I love the fixtures. But my issue is that I've, I'm not convinced he gets both. And even if he does start both, he'll get early subs, which is why I'm favouring Burrows and Diaz. But if if someone told me that just for a fact McBurney starts both, I don't know if Archer picked up an injury and they don't have any backup, I'd be very, very tempted. And again, if you want a spicy pick, he'll definitely start one McBurney. I'd be very surprised if he doesn't. I think he's on pens. The fixtures are there. McBurney could be a really nice shout. I think McBurney will start against McBurney will start against Burnley. And then I think it'll probably be Archer against Man United would be my prediction. But I really like him as an option. I think most people, though, are picking Solanke and then they've already got one of Cunha and Mateta and they may be considering the other or they're just selecting one of Cunha and Mateta. I would love to know down below, who do you prefer out of Cunha and Mateta, whether it be free hit or free transfers? Across the season, Mateta's data is appalling. And when I say appalling, Trent and I believe almost Robertson have better data across the season. So you are looking at Trent and Robertson have the same attacking threat as Mateta. That's terrible, but... Obviously, again, a lot of that was under Roy Hodgson. Across the last six, there has been a major improvement in his data with Saturday 0.56 non-penalty expected goal involvement, which is much better than Solanke. It's not far off Jesus. It's better than Cunha. It's almost as good as McBurney. It's better than Calvert-Lewin. So his data over the last six is much, much better. And he looks good as well. If you watch the games, Mateta looks fit. He looks like he's getting in the right positions. I don't think he's an elite finisher, but I do think he can take his chances, although he didn't against Liverpool, of course. So that is much more promising. With Cunha, 
He's obviously only just come back from injury, right? So take these this data with a pinch of salt, but it's pretty consistent for him. Cunha's data is good, but not great. He will get chances, but I think with Cunha, I do think he's a bit of a baller, but he's finishing. If you remember earlier in the season, he was going on all of these mazy runs and just not finishing anything. So I, I don't back that Cunha's like this elite finisher, but he can just pull a worldie out of nowhere, as we saw obviously in game week 33. So I think Cunha and Mateta is very close. So it, let's say that I think that they're both fine options. What swings it then for me? Two things, minutes and fixtures. Based on the fact that Cunha's just come back from injury, I think that Mateta's expected minutes are probably projected as slightly higher than Cunha's. Now, when it comes on to the fixtures, they're both playing at home for both games and they've both got a good game in there. But I would say that overall, Mateta against West Ham at home and Newcastle at home is just better than Cunha against Arsenal at home and Bournemouth at home. Bournemouth and Arsenal are both good defences. Newcastle and West Ham are not good defences. So I look at this and I just think, if I think they're close, which they are in my opinion, you just back the fixtures and the minutes. And I think Mateta has both of those. So at the moment, I am just about leaning towards saying that I think I prefer Mateta ahead of Cunha. So if I was to select the best three forwards at the moment for game week 34, let's assume you are either on your free hit or you can just choose freely. It would be Solanke, probably Mateta and Cunha, right? If you were to go in a 3-4-3, it probably would be those three. But a shout out to Darwin. Based on his minutes against Atalanta, there is a strong chance that I have Darwin in my free hit. I think he is good if we think he'll get enough minutes. And obviously, Haaland against anyone is a fine option too. If I was only selecting two though... I think it's Solanke and Mateta for me. And therefore, I'm in a 3-5-2. Little spoiler alert for my free hit on Friday. Unless something changes, like unless I just do genuinely just fancy Darwin as a pun, I think my front two on free hit will be Solanke and Mateta. I would love to know down below who will be your forwards going into 34. Are you going to play three? Are you going to play two? And who are they? So guys, there you have it. That is my Game Week 34 preview. Hopefully I've discussed most of the things that you wanted ahead of Game Week 34. But if there is anything else, please let me know down below in the comments. If you did enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button. And if you've watched to this point, but you've not subscribed yet, please do consider doing so. I do really appreciate it. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.